So a few weeks ago, I was in the hospital, one of my routine appointments, and one of my favourite doctors, his name is George, paused before asking me a question. The word as a patient is sometimes not a really good sign. Sometimes some of the most terrifying conversations that I've had with doctors have started with that pause. And he drew a really sort of short breath, and I could see him thinking, I'm and he says, Jess, do you think it's, it's possible that for somebody of your level of lung disease, you'd be a little bit too much? And I saw the words kind of come out of his mouth and then he was just waiting. And while I probably should have been all kinds of relieved that he could have said any number of things and it could have gone a completely different way, I turned around and said, of course not in a tone that I was a little bit embarrassed about later. And in fairness to him, the conversation that had preceded this was about whether it would be safe to fly to China for four days after, on the back of three weeks of IV intervention. And in my head, I was already working out whether it would be possible to get back on China, from China on the Tuesday and fly it to Melbourne for, the day, for a day of work on the Thursday. Maybe fair. But I suspect part of his hesitation in bringing up that conversation was that he knew what that answer would be. And while of course it's his responsibility <coughs> to ensure that, ensure that I'm aware of the risks and the limitations of my health, George also recognises that clinical indicators are only part of my story. And this is why I think he's a fantastic doctor. George takes the time to ask one really critical question of me. What matters to you? And it's a question that I think we're not asking enough in healthcare. And I strongly believe that in order to make patients center of their health system, in order to be able to treat them not as their disease, or to come up with a pathway that's right for them based on their disease, we have to ask them who they are as a person and then how does, that, how does their disease challenge what they want to do with their life? So my name is Jessica Bean and I'm really thrilled to be sharing, as I said, um, in my home state my experience as a chronic disease patient and why I believe that critical question needs to be in, needs to be integrated across all levels of healthcare. So I'll be highlighting some of my experiences um, as well as work in talking about a project that I've been working on throughout this year um, and I'm hoping to have a lot of time for questions at the end because I think that opening up time to have those conversations between stakeholders is really important. And while I can talk to you about my experience, what <coughs> I think will create change is when we can talk about my experience in relation to your experience and how that can all come together as a healthcare team. So, a few things about me. I really like writing and I really like eating healthy food. I enjoy spending time with my family, particularly at the beach in sunny Queensland. I am completely going to own that I am a crazy cat and dog lady, obsessed. That's my Pera and her little, her, well, Pera's little cat Ruby. I love travelling. And I love spending time at the beach and with my dog, again, because those really just are all you need to know about me. And along with healthy eating, I really like gelato. And gelato is totally sugar free and um, a health food in my eyes. <laughs> I also have cystic fibrosis. Those of you that don't, aren't all familiar with the disease, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that affects around 30,000 patients worldwide. Around 3,000 of those patients are in Australia 
And it might surprise you to know that Tasmania have a, has a higher incidence of cystic fibrosis um, per capita. Around 1 in 25 people are carriers of the disease. Um, and again, in Tasmania, so I think in Tasmania it's 1 in 20 people are carriers of the disease. And CF, CF is generally known as a lung disease. But as patients are living longer, CF is affecting patients in um, more ways and requiring different approaches to treatment. So this is a little slide that uh, a group called Team Jesse have put together <coughs> that shows just um, how comprehensive our approaches to care have to be. So sinuses are commonly affected in CF. Obviously the lungs, um, as I've said, is the, the primary source of problems, but also the treatments of those lung issues become treatments in other parts of the body, kidney, liver, um, but also we're already predisposed to liver disease um, due to the genetics of the disease. Um, our skin is abnorm abnormally salty, which can cause all kinds of problems, but um, probably one of the <coughs> more minor things on the scale. Uh, our digestive systems, um, we don't have our own enzymes to produce, to digest food, so we have to take um, digestive enzymes, and if I don't take those, I become very sick and mal malnourished over time. Um, reproductive <coughs> organs, most males with CF are infertile, and uh, females, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated with females, um, but often they really struggle. Um, and <coughs> The pancreas, most, um, about, sorry, about 50% of patients, adult patients, um, develop diabetes. So that's another little fun thing to manage on the side of everything else. So <clears throat> to manage my condition, um, each week I take around 367 tablets that I have to remember the times, how it has to be taken, <coughs> sorry, whether it has to be taken with food, away from food, um, all that fun stuff. I spent about 28 hours, so more than a full day, doing treatments. Um, and most of that's with a nebulizer and a physiotherapy device. And I interact with health professionals at least three times a week. So sometimes that's actually presenting at a clinic, uh, and sometimes that's dealing with people over the phone or going into my pharmacy to manage all those pills. Um, and that's when well. So that's my routine when I'm not in hospital or when I'm not having an exacerbation. And I can tell you that when I'm having an exacerbation, that routine is at least double. So my care team includes a cystic fibrosis pulmonary specialist or physician, a dietitian, physiotherapist, endocrinologist, social worker, clinical study coordinator, a chiropractor, a massage therapist, a pharmacist, and a clinical nurse. And again, that's when things are going relatively, relatively smoothly. So, it would be fair to say that I am probably a frequent flyer of the healthcare system, and that those interactions um, are really important to me because it's something that's not just a once-off experience, it's something that happens every single day pretty much in my life. When I take a holiday, CF doesn't take a holiday. CF comes with me and I still manage all those things no matter where in the world I am, no matter what I'm doing. And although there's really limited studies around what would happen if I didn't do all of those things, I think the life expectancy of CF patients really tells the story of that. In my, in my lifetime, CF has gone from a condition where patients didn't survive childhood to a disease where the majority of the population is actually adults. <coughs> so that really is quite telling. Um, there are some studies, again very limited, that suggest that if I were to stop all my treatments today, said no, I'm done, uh, my life expectancy would be around three to six months. So I am entirely dependent on these things. For me, it's not a choice. Um, and so I really have to make sure that each and every interaction that I have is in a way that best serves me. And I have to protect myself with those. 
but as a patient, I'm kind of limited in what I can do. My life didn't always look this um, comprehensively at my health. Um, I was relatively lucky as a child. Uh, I grew up with minimal exposure to the harsh reality of CF. I was quite healthy. I'd only had about three admissions up until the age of 16. Um, and my life was pretty packed with all kinds of other things, co-curricular activities, uh, study, um, and pretty good social life as well. And it meant that when my health declined really dramatically at 21, it was a really huge shock. Because all those other things that I did were such a huge part of my life and who I was and my plan, my five, my 10, my 20 year plan, because I was a planner. And without my health, I couldn't do any of them. And we talked about dates earlier and I don't actually remember a specific date, but I do remember what the weather was like. I remember what I was wearing. And I remember the feel of the room where I sat in a tiny cubicle in the Royal Hobart Hospital. My partner, he always came to, to the hospital with me for appointments, but on this one day, he wasn't there. And a doctor I didn't know particularly well sat across from me and said in a really blunt and <clears throat> um, unempathetic, unempathetic way, if you want a future, you are going to need a double lung transplant sooner than later. And in that sentence, my world just fell to pieces. I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what my future held. I couldn't control this. <clears throat> and while I absolutely support transplant and I think everybody should be organ donors, um, a life of a transplant patient for a lung transplant is quite limited. It's like trading one disease for another. And for me, many of the things that I wanted to do with my life wouldn't be possible if I had a transplant. So after many, many tears at the bottom of the shower, and many, many hours just sobbing, sobbing, hoping that there was another way, my husband and I came to the conclusion that transplant was not the right choice for me and that we would do <clears throat> everything that was humanly possible to prolong that process, if we couldn't stop it, to prolong it as long as possible. Because while transplant would have given me more time, I wasn't convinced about the quality of that time. And to me, the quality is what mattered. So husband and I were both, or boyfriend at that time, were both studying. We quit university, quit our jobs, and we moved to Queensland in pursuit of more specialised care and that nice sunshine that I quite like. And both our jobs, full time, became about fighting for my life. Instead of the things that our peers were doing, creating careers, starting families, travelling the world, our days were long, boring, repetitive. Pretty much our entire existence was about eat, sleep, treatment, repeat. I spent hours of day of the day connected to a nebulizer pump. I spent a lot of time stressing about had I eaten, even when I, the last thing I wanted to do was eat, but I needed to because I had to sustain my body. I visited the hospital at least weekly and that in itself was exhausting. We didn't have a car, we had to catch the bus. My body was frail. We'd spend hours waiting in uh, waiting rooms where I'd see other patients who were very unwell. And in them, I would think, well, is, is that my future? And I weighed between 38 and 45 kilos. So I was pretty tiny and here you can see um, me, um, and that's pretty much what our life was like. 
And again, this was when I was this was when I was well. Despite everything we were doing, I would still spend between three and six months in hospital and in a tiny cubicle away from my husband because he wasn't allowed to stay the night at the hospital where I had incredibly um, invasive intervention, medications that made me so unwell but were necessary. I was in pain and I felt really vulnerable in there. Um, <coughs> and for four years, that was, that was our life. It was a cycle of home, hospital, little time for um, social activities, time with friends. That was it. It was enough for me to keep transplant off, off the radar, off um, the doctor's lips. But it wasn't really a quality of life. We could sustain it, potentially for a limited amount of time, but it still didn't allow us to dream of a future. In 2013, my husband and I planned a wedding. And on the outside, it was the most beautiful wedding. I had an like, amazing dress, I had beautiful bridesmaids, we had a great venue, Joseph Cronies in, in Launceston. We had all the trimmings, an amazing photographer. But looking back on that day, it was a really, really sad time in my life. What should have been the happiest day of my life carried this deep, deep fear that my husband would have to bury me in the same year that he made me his wife. And that just tore me apart. I didn't want to do that to him. And we tried to focus on that day, but we both knew that the life we were living wasn't sustainable. And we couldn't have understood <coughs> just how right we were about that. Three weeks after our wedding, I became the sickest that I've ever, ever been. Instead of a honeymoon, I was hospitalised, where I again spent nights away from my new husband. I was dependent on oxygen. I could barely move out of bed on my own. And again, I was in so much pain. <coughs> I also knew that that word that I had fought so hard to ignore was again on doctor's lips. And even though they weren't saying it to me, I heard them talking about it outside my hospital door. And that burden of knowing I had to make a choice. When you're alone in a hospital room, just, I couldn't get it out of my head. We'd fought really hard, but there was nothing more that we could do. And despite being so aware of what the alternative was, I still didn't believe that transplant was the right choice for me. I don't use the term miracle lightly, and I think it's a, a, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot, especially in a health body. But if there is one period in my life where the term miracle is appropriate, it was then. Just when we thought that we had no other choices, no other options for treatment other than transplant, another option appeared that would have presented an alternative. And my miracle came in the form of a clinical trial. A clinical trial for the first drug to treat the cause of cystic fibrosis, not just the symptoms. A genetic modulator therapy specifically targeting my gene mutation of CF of which there are about 1,400 different mutations. It had been a really hot topic in the cystic fibrosis community, and these days patient communities are increasingly connected online. We know what's going on. We know what people are saying about things. It's been a real game changer, especially in cystic fibrosis, where we actually can't have physical contact with one another because we pose a great health risk to one another. So online, you can have those conversations that um, previously we hadn't been able to have. And this drug was the conversation point. Because an earlier treatment for a different genetic mutation of cystic fibrosis had been absolutely groundbreaking. In terms of lung function, this is the key indicator that has always been used in cystic fibrosis. The results have been absolutely remarkable. 
for as long as I can remember, lung function has been the indicator in my life that has held the most significance. It's the number that has triggered a hospital admission, it's the number that has um, made me very fearful, and it's also the thing that has made me go, yeah, I've got a good number, I'm beating this. There is an incredible amount of emotion attached to those numbers. And even when every other spine says that I'm doing well, I am still to this day nervous as I walk down the hall to do my lung function. Because it's something that I can't always control. But I know what a huge impact that that number could have on my life. And the focus has always been those numbers. But it was those very numbers that were the thing that could have could prevent me from accessing the trial. Those, those numbers were what could have dashed my hopes for having a future with a man that I loved. In Australia, the clinical trials process is highly competitive, especially in disease areas where the therapy is groundbreaking and <coughs> even more so, sorry, even more so um, where, I was talking about being uncoordinated before, there we go. So, but uh, particularly um, in areas where it's a really rare disease, so um, they don't always bring those trials to Australia. So that process is incredibly competitive and it puts a lot of strain on patients because like me, you know that that might be the only hope that you have. So for this trial, there were going to be a thousand participants globally. And my specific centre would get approximately a handful, but they didn't know it's a competitive recruitment process, pretty much first in best dressed. <clears throat> and as I sat in my hospital bed, I was hide, hardly the ideal candidate. And the biggest thing was that to get even a interview, if you like, for the clinical trial, my lung function had to be above 40%. Now, Lung function is something that changes um, every day. It can depend on the weather, it can depend on the season, it can depend on what I've eaten, how tired I am, how much sleep I've got. Again, a lot of those things are often out of my control. At the time, on the absolute best of days, my lung function was 41%. And there was zero negotiation when it came to admittance into a clinical trial. <laughs> So my life came down to being able to blow on that day above the 40. 1% was what my life depended on. And I knew that I had to do everything that was humanly possible to get that number. It's quite incredible what a little hope can do. Because while I was lying in a hospital bed feeling hopeless and out of options, once I knew that the cards were on the table for this trial, somehow I found a way to dig just a little bit deeper. And every minute of every day became dedicated to my health. I'm talking every minute, people, like every minute was scheduled. And I completely isolated myself from the community because I was scared that if I got a cold, if I got a virus, if I got a stomach bug, it would instantly knock me out of contention. So after the two of the absolute longest months of my life, and probably the hardest period I've ever, ever been through, on the 30th of June, 2013, my husband and I left, I get goosebumps when I talk about this, my husband and I left the hospital holding the hope that we had wished so hard for on our wedding day. A precious box filled with little pink pills. And this was the happiest day of our life. For the first time walking away from the hospital, we allowed ourselves to dream of a future and what it could be like. <coughs> Something, a future with certainty, a future with more than just pills and treatments. We really clung to that. And little did we know what a huge impact two tiny pink pills could make. <coughs> began with differences in my life that nobody could really see. 
of a morning, I'd wake up and instead of being engulfed by a coughing fit, I could take a deep breath. I was coughing less throughout the day. I was experiencing less pain. I could walk up a flight of stairs or I could run for a bus. And those little th things turned into more obvious things. I was able to leave the house on my own for the first time in a few years. I was able to become a little bit more independent. I had the energy to go and see my friends without having to spend days recovering from just, say, going out for coffee. We could even maybe go away for a weekend. And things that I didn't even realise that I couldn't do became, starting, started to become obvious in my life. I began to realise that I could laugh without it becoming a massive coughing fit. I had to teach myself to yawn again because previously when I tried to yawn, my lungs would stop. And so I couldn't take that breath. So I had to teach myself to yawn or just look really silly. I was able to cry without being, without gasping for breath. And I began to see more stability which also meant flex flexibility and freedom. All of a sudden, my life became more than just fighting to breathe. And then the unimaginable things became possible again. My husband returned to work, which is a really important thing for an early something 20 year old to be able to say that he does more than just care for his wife. Because often society doesn't value that and they'd see him as a bludger. I can tell you his days were not spent watching television. Mm -hmm. I became studying to become a health coach and things like travel and social engagements popped up on our calendar instead of health appointments and reminders to take medications. We had space in our lives to breathe and to live again. And in the context of my life, the study the study drug had been absolutely remarkable. Everything that I could have wished for and more. But they all came in line of one really, really surprising thing. The benchmarks that I had been so fixated on, those numbers that I believed were the determinant of success, had only seen a really modest improvement. And what I realised was that I'd never been looking for numbers. I was looking for the things that mattered to me and, my, and the study, <coughs> my study data didn't reflect that. It didn't reflect what the trial medication had meant for my life. And that became even more apparent when the full data for the study was released. The benefit that I'd received was blurred amongst averages, predetermined markers of success and study, study design that just wasn't capable of reflecting the true impact of this therapy. I felt really guilty about that because <clears throat> it's really hard to have something in your life that has completely changed your world. But to see other patients not thriving, not doing well, that took some time to get my head around. But when I moved through that, I felt that it was really unfair that somehow because other people hadn't benefited, my benefits didn't really seem to matter as much in the data. And it made me start to ask some questions. Because it was pretty terrifying knowing that in the assessment process for other people getting access to this therapy, that data was all that people would look at. And my experience wasn't adequately represented. <coughs> for me, even if my numbers had been remarkable, even if they had been the groundbreaking um, figures that we had thought that we might find, unless my quality of life had also changed, what would have been the difference? As a patient, meaningful outcomes, they happen in my daily life. They don't happen on a piece of paper, and there's so much bigger than that. Especially as we move in the direction of personalised medicine, personalised care, there has never been a more important time to recognise the impact that these therapies can have on people's lives. 
and make sure that everybody's experience is represented. <clears throat> to date, three years after this child therapy, which is now called or can be, uh, was approved by our regulatory authority, so for safety of effic efficacy, it is still not approved for public reimbursement in Australia. And with a price tag of $300,000, there is no way that patients can access it unless it becomes approved. So when I completed my study as a coach, one of the biggest things that I wanted to do was work with young women living with chronic illness to empower them to be advocates for their own care. And for a period of time, I really loved doing that. It was really fulfilling and I could great, get great results with individuals. But what was the point if those patients then hit <laughs> systematic blocks that they often had no ability to change? That approach puts the responsibility, and in a lot of cases the blame, on the individual to create the pathway they need for the best health outcomes. And unfortunately, as much as we can empower individuals, that alone isn't enough. It's not enough to ensure they can access the best quality care and the type of services that they need to make a difference to the things that matter to them. We're dealing with some really, really big challenges and challenges in areas where change is slow, certainly slower than progress in medical science. So, that, so we need multi-level action, we need multi-stakeholder action, and we need change that recognises particularly for patients with chronic illness, where we interact with the system really frequently, that every single interaction matters. And every time we're connecting, touch, making a touch point in the, in the hospital process, in the healthcare, um, in our healthcare, every one of those interactions matters. And change has to happen across the board. Of course, the difficulty comes in fitting those patients' experiences into frameworks that apply some kind of systematic process to divide a pie that can't be unlimited. And even though many of the things that matter to me in my life <coughs> matter far more than money, I also recognise that we can't just give everything to everyone. There has to be some kind of system around it. I think it just comes down to, though, who should be the gatekeeper? And can we spread that more evenly across stakeholders? When we don't ask people with lived experience of a disease what matters to them, we take a really limited view of what a disease looks like. We treat disease as a perceived need rather than lived experience. And as a patient, I don't really see that as being particularly efficient. While that approach may have served us in the past, as science evolves and science is more innovative, our approaches to care and approaches particularly to policy have to also be innovative. We have to find ways of making sure that the incredible breakthroughs that we have in all areas of healthcare, whether it be medicines or whether it be technology available to us, are met with innovation in the ways that we access it. Because if things are available, but patients can't get them, What's the point? We talk a lot about investing in innovation, investing in research, but what's the point if patients can't actually get it at the other end? I really truly believe that patients can play an important, pragmatic and meaningful role in reshaping our approaches to healthcare. And if it, I think it's critical that we do. It just, it doesn't, doesn't it make sense that people li who live with diseases are asked, what are their priorities in treating their disease? What's the hardest part of your day? What keeps you awake at night? What stops you from going to work? And doesn't it make sense to ask patients, why would you prefer this treatment over this treatment? What would make you more compliant with this treatment over this treatment? They're often the things that only patients know because we live with the condition every day. We don't just look at it on a piece of paper. Certainly, I'm not saying that we don't need other experts. Those people are really important and I am really grateful that people invest so much of themselves and their lives in doing that. 
but patients at least deserve a seat at the table. So largely based on my frustration, a lot of my time and energy over the past year has been devoted to the Patient Voice Initiative. The Patient Voice Initiative is a key group of healthcare stakeholders who are working to enhance the patient voice in health technology assessment. And this is just one area of healthcare, but I think it really demonstrates um, how healthcare pathways can be really prohibitive and also how we might be able to change it. So currently in Australia, the process for ac patients accessing medications looks a bit like this, and I really apologise to anybody in the room who specialises in this area. Do we have any? Because um, this is really simplified, but I think it will get the point across. So, um, to start with, we have a drug development pipeline that goes through a trials process, as I've talked. In Australia, that once it gets to something that they have found is successful, it works in patients, it's safe, then it goes to the TGA. Um, in America, we use the FDA. Well, in America, they use the FDA, um, which a lot of Australians have actually heard about and probably know more about the FDA or have heard the FDA more than they've heard about the TGA. But in Australia, we have the TGA. And they purely base, purely base their approval on safety and efficacy. But in order for patients to then access therapies on the PBS, so that discounted price, especially when we're talking about very expensive therapies, that therapy then needs to be PBS listed. And that process is largely based on cost effectiveness. So um, the sponsor or the manufacturer of medication puts in a submission to the BBAC, who is the committee that decide upon whether um, medications and therapies are or are not listed on the PBS. They evaluate it, and then it goes to the minister for final sign-off, but the decision is largely made by the PBAC. Now, in that process, the points where patients can have input come pretty much at the end. So patients are obviously involved in the drug development stage, but it's really passive. Patients are recruited, um, they participate in the trials, and then their data gets used. There's very limited um, input around TGA approval, and the big part is the PBAC submission and the PBAC process, because that, that's, as I said, all depends on whether it will be public or invest. So in the PBAC process, a sponsor may choose to involve patients, but there's a lot of regulations that prevent particularly drug companies, and the majority of sponsors are drug companies, um, that limits what they're allowed to, how they're allowed to interact with patients. And I think that keeping patients safe is really important. We can't just allow drug companies to, to deal with patients directly in um, but we also ha can't say to patients, well, you know nothing and you can't make these choices for themselves. There has to be a balance in how we allow that engagement to happen, especially when it's mutually beneficial. So maybe there is interaction at that point. Then patients are called once the submission is through and the announcement is made that the PBAC will be deciding whether medication gets listed. Um, there is a call out for patients to write a written submission for themselves and to say why they believe or don't believe that the drug should be put up for public reimbursement. Just a little bit of homework for you. When you get home, have a bit of a Google about the, P about, um, the PBAC. See if you can find the information. <laughs> See if you can make sense of that because at the moment the website is really difficult to find and the majority of healthcare professionals wouldn't even know where on that website to put a submission in. Let alone, as a patient, what the hell do I put in that thing? We're not, we're not trained to be able to provide that kind of information and it doesn't necessarily benefit decision makers when we do because they're, not getting, they're perhaps not getting the information that they actually need to make a choice. So that's, that's one point. Um, <clears throat> there is also a consumer representative on the PBAC, um, but that's one person on a committee that makes huge decisions. 
and she personally has to read through every single submission that gets put in manually. She is responsible for that. Um, and recently there has been the introduction of consumer hearings as part of the PBAC process. However, you have to have an invitation to attend one of those. And it largely depends on if you are associated with a big patient group. And for rarer conditions, it can be even really hard to find patients that are able to go to those things because there's not always a patient group to represent patients. So as you can see, again, a lot of the responsibility falls on the patient. They also have to know what this process is. Because if you don't know what the process is for listing of medications, how on earth are you going to go, okay, well, I've got to put a submission in now? A lot of patients don't know this stuff. And um, they wouldn't even know where they can have input. Um, so they're just a couple of issues that are really challenging about the, the process as it is. And these are medications that people's lives depend on them. This is every medication that a patient accesses under our public health care system in Australia. Unless a patient can afford for a treatment, it has to be listed this way. So it's a, it's a really huge challenge and it affects patients much more than we realise. So Patient Voice Initiative is putting together currently a report that will make recommendations for change. And some of those changes are as simple as providing a consumer friendly website. In this day and age, it seems pretty simple for me, to me, but um, it can make a huge impact to patients if they can get readily available, plain speak, easy to understand information about what this process is, what evaluates it, what they evaluate, and how we can have input. Um, it, it literally can make the difference between perhaps a medication being approved or not being approved if we can make sure that the patient voice is as effective as possible in this process. I think the key theme in all of what we're doing, because some of it will, as I said, so sorry, some of it will be as simple as that and some, some things will require legislative change. But the key theme for all of it is that patients are included and asked about what is important to them, what matters to them in a way that's respectful, in meaningful, and considered in a way that can be integrated within frameworks. There's no point in asking patients what matters to them if it's just a box checking exercise. Yep, we've done that. How's it, going to be, how's it going to be integrated into the process? How's it going to be weighted in the process? Because while it's great that we have things like the consumer hearings now, there is no transparency around how it's weighted in the process. And so of course this is just one example um, of why and how meaningful engagement with patients is important. Um, but I think it's representational of um, not only the policy shift that needs to happen, but the cultural shift in healthcare. Again, it, it can't be a nice afterthought. It has to start right at the beginning, from how we design studies to capture what matters to patients, to how and why we're accessing um, medications, and importantly, how we interact with patients when they present to, to hospitals, um, when they're admitted as patients, when they're sitting in waiting rooms. Um, as Chris has also mentioned today. So again, every interaction matters and it, it really does require everybody to get involved to make a difference. Patients, we have the most at stake, but sometimes we're not in a position to make the difference. And we really need a collaborative effort to, to make this difference and to ensure that our healthcare is representational of our needs. So following on that conversation that I had with my doctor three weeks ago about whether I was going to go to China or not, I did go to China and I was really thrilled to be able to present at the, chat, at the International Conference on Rare Diseases and Orphan Drugs. And my doctor was actually pretty supportive, um, although he did ask me to email him as soon as I touched down back in Australia, just goes how much he really does care. But it was in him allowing me to go, because he could have been the one that said no. I required him to sign off on forms. It was really in his court. But in him doing so, he put me in the driver's seat of my healthcare. He respected my choices 
not just as a clinical case study, but as a person who is so much more than just a number. He recognised that travel is something that I really value. Um, and, and it's the why to what I do. It's the why to my long hours of treatments. It's the why to going through all the painful procedures. It's the why to being compliant with my treatments every single day. Because as patients, we don't work hard to admire per perfect numbers. And we, we work hard to be able to live. We work hard to be able to do the things that matter to us. And as much as he might not have agreed that going on a trip overseas would have been the best in the best interest of my physical health, he recognised it was my choice to decide that. It's my choice to decide quality over quantity. We're incredibly fortunate to have a health system in Australia that is very good at keeping the patients alive. We're incredibly lucky to have that. But in a system like Australia, I don't even think that's enough anymore. I think what we want as patients is a system that supports us to live. Not just be alive, but to live. That this is just as important as this. And to do that, we need more Georges in the system. Mm -hmm. So my challenge for all of you here today <clears throat> is that how can you take the time to ask patients and that those you are working with what matters to you? And not just listen to it, but how can you use their answer <clears throat> to benefit their care? Whether that be by helping it to use your decision, helping it to inform your decision about which treatment pathway might be best for them, or by using it to help them be inspired, motivated, compliant with their care. What can you do as people that we depend on to support patients to live and not just be alive.